to our honorary degree recipients, alumni and trustees, to our faculty and staff, to our parents, family members and friends, and most especially to our graduates, welcome to the Johns Hopkins University commencement for the great class of 2016. Now, I know, I know that some of you may not have aspired to be the first to graduate in the Royal Farms Arena, a temple to our local convenience store, to fried chicken tenders and Western fries. But trust me, your dry, comfortable, warm families and friends think you are the most thoughtful and brilliant class ever, particularly given the cold and rainy deluge that has descended upon Baltimore over the last three weeks. Okay, so it's sunny now, but it was really bad for the last three weeks. No one's going to get drenched here today. No one is going to suffer heat stroke. Indeed, during your time here, <laughs> I suppose. The undergraduates weren't clapping, but their families were. <laughs> you are wise. Indeed, during your time here, graduates, you have brought the same characteristic thoughtfulness and brilliance to so many large and vexing questions. Is it acceptable to eat your weight in shrimp at this Sunday brunch at FFC? Which will you sneak into, Gilman Tower, or the steam tunnels, or both? Is it okay to steal a safe seat in the Brody reading room? Of course, we know, we know that these aren't the truly significant concerns upon which you've been focused during your years at Johns Hopkins. Instead, your focus and your studies have opened new understandings of creative expression, scientific discovery, and social and economic theory. And you have been here at a time when the national and local conversation has been framed by urgent and probing issues of race, class, politics, and justice. All issues that are there at their core are about the complex nature of human experience and perspective and the institutions that shape embody and perpetuate that complexity. Sometimes we confront this complexity in people and institutions at some distance, but more often we do so in close and very personal ways. And let me share one example with you. And each morning, I leave Nichols House, my house on the campus, and walk along Bowman Drive to my office at Garland Hall. It is named for Isaiah Bowman, the fifth president of Johns Hopkins University, who served from 1935 to 1948. His term spanned the rise of Nazism in Europe and the cataclysm of World War II and its immediate aftermath. As some of you well know, Dr. Bowman's story is complicated. Now here's the good. He was a renowned geographer and academic leader whose vision for the university including bringing the Applied Physics Laboratory into our institution and sowing the seeds of interdisciplinary research that have proven so prescient today. As a public servant, he advised presidents and participated in discussions that launched the United Nations. But here's the other side, here's the rest of the story. Dr. Bowman was an unrepentant racist and an anti-Semite. He introduced a 10% quota for Jewish students at a time when many other institutions of higher education in the United States who had those practices decided to end them. But that's when he started. He actively blocked the hiring of Jews into the professoriate and derailed the applications of African American students against the recommendations of the faculty. I am a Jew his father emigrated from Europe on the eve of the Holocaust, and as you would expect, I have a visceral reaction to Dr. Bowman. He is a flawed leader whose ideas and actions are not only reprehensible to me, 
from the perspective of the present, but even, I believe, inexcusable in the context of his time. And yet, and yet, his accomplishments individually and on behalf of our university are real and undeniable. On that daily walk along Bowman Drive, I'm unavoidably in a dialogue with a man whose views I abhor, but whose legacy lives on at the university, the recipient of his successes and his failures. F. Scott Fitzgerald once wrote, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. I take from this not that we should adopt a naive view of the world that suggests you can find good in anyone, no matter how harmful their views or actions may be, nor that we should be governed by a convenient moral relativism and therefore incapable of any judgment. Rather, we must be open to the complexities and contradictions of humankind, and through that broad aperture, seek better, more informed, and more just decisions for ourselves, for our institutions, and for our society. Now, we all know we're living in a moment of considerable oversimplification. This is a world where we judge, you judge, potential partners with a swipe, where policy debates are adjudicated in 140-character tweets, where the news cycle is 24 hours, yet reduces opinions on everything from pandemics to geopolitical upheaval, to Beyonce's marriage, to a 30-second soundbite. And in this context, we must strain to see, to understand, and to reckon with greater complexity. If we do not, we deny ourselves the opportunity to learn from people's flaws or to be surprised, to be astonished by their abilities by their actions. If we do not, we are robbed of the chance to let multiple strains of information collide and percolate in our minds as we form more nuanced interpretations. One thing can help us navigate a way forward in a world that is rarely sketched in black and white, but instead painted in rich hues of gray. Your commencement speaker today, Spike Lee, illuminates the nuances of the human character in his masterpiece film, Do the Right Thing. You're gonna hear that a lot today. A film that I still find bracing nearly 30 years after I first saw it. The film explores the intertwined experiences of neighborhoods, of neighbors rather, in a Brooklyn community on the verge of explosive racial conflict. In the midst of this slice-of-life drama, Spike Lee inserted a series of straight-to-camera tirades by characters representing all the races and ethnicities in the neighborhood. Each was more invective-filled and racially charged than the next. It is searing. The viewer is forced to confront the contradictions of these characters. Some hold deeply bigoted views, yet they also live cheek by jowl with one another, sometimes in harmony, sometimes in conflict. No character is one note. Only when taken together can we understand fully the picture of life in that community at that moment. And whether on screen in, or in our lives, it is only by holding such contradictions, such complexities, that we can understand and hope to change the trajectory of our shared story. Graduates of the class of 2016, you are an extraordinarily talented, fearless, and determined group of people. You have spent time here honing your many extraordinary God-given gifts. We are counting on you to be among those who are able to see, indeed, who are determined to see the full scope, the full complexity of the human experience. The world will be better for that. We are so very proud of you. Godspeed and congratulations to the great 
class of 2016.